Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. Writing in his essay, The Alien Face of Cosmopolitanism, Amit Chowdhury observes that a particular conversation gave him, quotes, an intimation of lines of contact I should have known more about, close quotes. The essays in The Origins of Dislike had much the same effect on me. Whether reading his thoughts on Kafka or creative writing, Henry Green or historicism, Merotra or Morrissey, all these and many more are present in this collection, the recurrent sensation was that here was someone who, through originality of insight and meticulous thought, was not only capable of hoisting us out of the furrows ploughed by lazy literary criticism, but also of helping orient the reader in their attempt to understand how different cultures, art forms and time periods interconnect. Written with both the exact mind of the academic and the freewheeling spirit of the novelist, The Origins of Dislike is a consistently compelling collection. Amit Chowdhury is the author of seven novels, the latest of which is Friend of My Youth, which will be published in French next year. He's, he's also his second collection of poetry uh, will be published in January by Salt, uh, under the title Sweet Shop. He's also a critic and musician and composer. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, um, well, his, awards for his fiction include the Commonwealth Writers Prize, the Betty Trask Prize, the Encore Prize, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Fiction, and the Indian Government's Sahitya Academy Award. In 2013, he was awarded the first Infosys Prize in the Humanities for Outstanding Contribution to Literary Studies. He's a Professor of Contemporary Literature at the University of East Anglia, and currently a Fellow at the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination here in Paris. I'm also very pleased to have Letitia Zucchini as my co-chair tonight. Letitia is a research fellow at the CNRS in Paris, working on contemporary Indian literatures, especially on contemporary Indian poets writing in English. Her recent publications include a monograph on Kalatka and Modernisms in India, published by Bloomsbury, a translation of Kalatka's Kala Goda poems into French, and a double special issue of an academic journal entitled The, Words of bon the Worlds of Bombay Poetry. Terry Eagleton has called Amit Chaudhuri's writing supreme, uh, superbly original and genuinely groundbreaking and exciting, while Rita Felsky, the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of English at the University of Virginia, wrote, These essays testify to a formidable intelligence at work. Chaudhuri's engaging yet exacting reflections range widely across literature and the arts. Puncturing intellectual pieties and lazy thinking, they challenge us to rethink how art and the world connect. Please join me in welcoming both Letitia Zucchini and Amit Chaudhuri to Shakespeare and Company. And I think we're going to begin tonight with Letitia introducing um, Amit's critical work a little bit further. Um, yes, thank you very much. I, am, I must say that I'm delighted uh, to be, thanks to Shakespeare and Co. and thanks to Adam, uh, in conversation again with Amit, whose cr critical and creative work has been hugely influential for me, but I know for many others as well. And I'm speaking here both as a critic or scholar of Indian literature, and we know Amit's distaste for academia or impatience with academic doxa. Yeah, I was going to say that <laughs> there are no exacting uh, yeah. academic... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> practitioners. <laughs> um, so both yeah. as a critic, as, as a scholar, sorry, of Indian literature, but also simply as as so many here tonight, as readers and lovers of literature, who also engage with literary history, with writing, art, or modernity. What I mean to say is that the fact that Amit Chaudhuri is Indian is of course deeply formative for him and at the same time totally incidental. His creative and creative Cri critical work, which are both indistinguishable, is, as he says, says himself, unfit for appropriation, especially for national appropriation or generic labels. Amit Chaudhuri is not just an Indian writer, and in some ways, but I'd like to know, uh, Amit, what you think of these words by Kolatkar, uh, in some ways, perhaps, what makes him Indian should really take care of itself. Uh, he's a writer to court, a formidable writer and a formidable critic whose craft as intellectual and historical practice is deeply engaging and illuminating for all those who practice or are interested in literature, in philosophy, in theory, theory in criticism. So one of the great pleasures and challenges of reading Amit lies in its provocative, unsettling, disruptive dimension. In many ways, and I'm here borrowing words that you use, Amit, to define Indian poets in English, uh, Amit Chaudhuri is like a jazz musician, listening acutely to the conflicting tonality. 
He forces us to read and read again, to question what we take for granted, what is given, the available handed down narratives, histories, cartographies, and categories, which he interrogates, sometimes turns around, at least reinvents or rediscovers in the process or in the movement of writing. And I quote you um, in one of your essays, the one indif indefatigable, modest, self-renewing moral purpose of both creative and critical language is to dismantle and refuse to reconfirm what we already know is true. So dismantle, <laughs> refuse what we already know is true, and renew or rediscover, turning away from, turning uh, to words. That's where your dislikes or dismissals are also acts of endorsements, affiliation. And you say that, that dislike is, um, you write that dislike uh, is also an expression of appetite and engagement. And many essays in the book uh, are actually about writers, poets, photographers, filmmakers that you like rather than dislike. Um, and I quote you again, Critical language is a reinvention of lineage, and we'll perhaps try to speak about these other disruptive, non-canonical lineages of Indian literature, by which you express your impatience with the way Indian literature is read, understood, identified with, especially outside India, um, the practices and forms which Indian literature is often assigned to. And I'll stop here because my introduction is a little too long and let you... <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's great and very generous and uh, uh, um, really happy to be here, Adam. Thank you uh, for inviting me. And um, uh, I, I, I'm one of those people who was always kind of more drawn to uh, criticism than the actual work. I mean, I would often not read Beckett, but I'd read about Beckett. And and uh, right now I felt like I didn't want to talk. I just wanted to you to just go on uh, because uh, because what I was what I what I would say would be less interesting than than you know. Um, but um, I was wondering if we could begin um, with with the collection of essays itself. Now, when when you when you're writing about uh, the, the process of composing a novel, uh, in the you mentioned several times this sort of the the novel is born out of the story you want to tell, but also of the the time, the moment of which you're writing it, the life that's going on around the, the writing of the novel. And I'm curious about the um, collection of essays. When it came, to, when you decided that uh, it was time to collect your essays, to put them out, and when you were rereading them, and when you were deciding what order they were going to go in, and which ones perhaps you were going to include, and perhaps there were some that mm. you, uh, you decided not to include. I was wondering if you could just say, did you discover anything about yourself about how you'd been at the time over the period when you were writing those essays in the period when you were when you were collecting them right um well i mean uh, just to sort of go back to what you said about writing novels i mean uh, i i generally don't i'm trying to think um th um want to write a novel because i have a story mm -hmm. that i think i want to now uh, write about but um i have very simple ideas as as a novelist and um and i I started out with 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 these simple ideas ex exciting me. For instance, um, uh, uh, when I wrote my first novel, A Strange and Sublime Address. Now, A Strange and Sublime Address is about a boy who's growing up in Bombay, and he's growing up uh, in the on the twelfth story of of a tall building, looking out at the sea, and uh, and then he. Um, the, the novel or the very short novel is about him visiting with his mother uh, the city of calcutta and south calcutta and his uncle's house um in my in my head i had no other kind of idea except that i wanted to write about um a holiday i i i, I didn't realize at that time that you know um this was rather strange that I wanted to write a novel without actually having a story to tell as such, and I, that, that I thought that the change of location was enough for me to work with. Uh, but um, in, in retrospect, I, 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 I see that um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the way I plunged into writing the novel, and if I had if been 
I mean, obviously, I knew novels were about stories, but if but if somebody had said to me, "You need to write," you know, now you, you're going to write novels, you need to think up stories to to tell, I would then have never written a novel. Uh, I I I I began to write novels because somehow I was unaware of the fact that one had to tell stories in novels. <laughs> you know, I I I I. I I I was strangely in, uh, innocent and ingenuous about the risk I was taking and took again and again and again. And the risk uh, for me had to do with just writing about nothing other than a change of location. In every novel I explore, I now see a change of location. The change of location brings with it a change of meaning in the everyday. So generally when you go on holidays, of course you think of going on holidays as a, almost as a duty to see a monument mm -hmm. or to see uh, what's most identifiable with that particular place, what you've heard marks that place for being what it is. Uh, but the kind of holidays that I'm talking about are, you know, breaks taken and gone somewhere else to your uncle's house or whatever, where, where you see no monuments, but where one kind of everyday is replaced with another kind of everyday, the kind you left behind, um, you never noticed. But this everyday uh, is changed slightly because it's in another location, in another home, uh, in another, on another street. And so you suddenly begin to notice the street and the home and the place as you didn't when you were not on holiday. Um, so I, I was just interested in being able to be, uh, to inhabit a kind of way of living where one could for a short duration of time uh, look at what you already knew in a different way mm -hmm. um, and 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 I, I I find this whole business of um, time being arrested in this way where the meanings uh, of things are changed uh, th this is what I understand by uh, um, the poetic the genre of of the of the poetic and and what I understand as narrative is something incremental mm -hmm. where you know more and more in in uh, within the genre of the poetic but when you finish reading that particular work which might also be a poem mm -hmm. uh, there is a transformation so you end the poem you finish reading it but you don't learn you have necess you haven't necessarily learned more mm -hmm. than what you knew earlier when you do finish a, a narrative work you have learned something about those characters uh, the, the to to me the the um the main sort of example of this is a, is a work in which um, one kind of work is embedded in another. The poetic is embedded in the narrative, and this is the Mahabharat and the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. So the Bhagavad Gita is is this kind of interruption in the Mahabharat, and the Mahabharat is an epic where two clans are at war with each other. Uh, two 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 clans that are related to each other have gone to war, mm -hmm. and the Mahabharat is a great is is possibly the greatest. Um, narrative work in the world. Uh, once you've gone through the Mahabharat, you uh, um, you then you you then have you've learned something astonishing about the way lives change. Um, but you don't you don't need to revisit it immediately. With the Gita, as with the poem, there's a st there's a state of stasis. Ma um, Krishna is speaking to Arjun about various things, including uh, the, 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 the kind of um, wisdom of acting without looking for the outcome of action or thinking of the outcome of action. There's a kind of stasis when, when this kind of paradox is being discussed, this kind of strange piece of advice, completely weird piece of advice is being discussed. Action without outcome. What, what on earth is that action? And so this interruption, you, you actually learn nothing from it. You, but you, f you feel a transformation within you. The thing about this kind of poetic text is that you can start then reading it right from the start, the moment you finish it. You can reread a poem the moment you finish the poem because you have actually learned nothing from it. You have been transformed by it. Um, I, I, I kind of now realize that I, this is more what I was kind of interested in as a writer. And it didn't occur to me then that th maybe the novel is not the best place to 
you know undertake this kind of project but others had other novelists had so uh, so um now as far as the, this book of essays was concerned um I I've been writing the so I had I have another book of critical essays called Clearing a Space uh and and I'd been writing essays after 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 that one came out um and one thing that I didn't want this book like all my other critical books was to be a monograph mm-hmm. and I didn't want people to think it was about dislike mm-hmm. alone I just thought this this is a good title let's put it there <laughs> um but but you know um uh, there was also a time when uh I was flirting with the idea and my wife was kind of pressuring me to do this to bring out the origins of dislike as a short book mm. just one essay yeah. uh which I I thought about but then I thought I've written all these other essays what am I going to do with them you know I need to put them in as well so um uh, <laughs> so 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 you know I I I then decided to collect <coughs> all the essays but then they had sim- they, they weren't all about dislike uh-huh. but what they were about is not taking for granted all these things we we are told about ourselves in terms of our our cultural affinities and affiliations and what form uh, what forms us mm-hmm. you know all of the essays are are looking at those mm-hmm. and and saying that you no know, um, you have to we have to start again mm-hmm. we have to start from scratch in terms of how we describe ourselves our responses what we are doing mm-hmm. I think it could be interesting to unpack this concept of dislike yeah. a little bit because um I think uh when you your description of it's like so well, okay well I put these other essays sort of ar- around this one and you know you, I just like the title I think that yeah that's it's completely ever, true yeah, but yeah. it also no, feels no, no. ever so slightly disingenuous because yeah. there is something about the the title essay which as you said so sort of does seem to inform uh or at least to sort of embody the uh, the approach that you take to mm. a lot of a lot of your essay writing yeah. now of course um well perhaps first of all for people in the audience who haven't had the chance to read yeah. that essay yet perhaps yeah. you could unpack a little bit that co- specific your specific sure. understanding of sure. dislike um oh, oh yeah i mean uh, th- there were both kind of things going on in my head i must put all the essays in i must put, i must have uh, give the book a catchy title uh, that was uppermost in my mind of course but but at the se- at the same time i i did realize that all the st- other stuff i was doing was related to the origins of dislike uh, the the title essay um <clears throat> but the title essay to es- explain what the dislike is about it's it's my dislike uh, of uh, of renaissance painting uh and 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 so you know um uh i i i kind of describe in the, the in the essay uh, it, the essay starts with in fact this this city this uh, wonderful city and 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 the, and the louvre uh, and and uh a, a walk through the louvre with my wife where i'm ranting to her about about <laughs> you know the centrality that's given to renaissance mm-hmm. art and my sense of relief when i when i go off into the mesopotamian mesopotamian section or the sections that have russian icons like the pre-renaissance stuff the sense of complete wonder relief and joy you know um and and it, it, i'm not an expert on renaissance art and so this is not an essay about renaissance art it's an essay about prejudice mm-hmm. and it's an essay about um about being liberated by being able to kind of address and explore your prejudice you know um in my case the prejudice was deeply related by by the way i, I make kind of little um i i i i try to sort of um make it a more slightly more nuanced sort of uh, invective uh in that i do say that uh, i i i like giotto mm-hmm. you know <laughs> uh, but, but, but but you know i i like that you know the early kind of renaissance art where the byzantine kind of elements are still there the mask like elements are still present the moment it becomes realistic and the neoclassicism begins to humanize everything and i i did a, if this were a tv series i would have kind of televised my second not my second but my last visit to the louvre with my wife with with the book having come out mm-hmm. and we went through that room again that long room and i showed her this painting by this very famous painting by this um, famous artist whose name i have now completely forgotten um uh, who who had painted napoleon uh, uh, on a horse in battle uh, what's what's the name 
Um, sorry? Possibly. Um, so, <laughs> what what was what was interesting? What was interesting about that huge canvas, this huge huge painting, is uh, the horse horse's eye uh, showed uh, a, um, a sense of uh, emotion, which which uh, which uh, which was strange. Uh, um, one would not necessarily notice that, but I pointed it out to my wife. Look look at what he's up to now. You know, uh, uh, so so this this is the kind of centrality of of the enlightenment and and um, and and, and uh, the predominance of the human, then um, informing every every detail of what of what we see. You know, interestingly, the horse for 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 writers like D. H. Lawrence is a metaphor for the other, the non-human. You cannot appropriate the horse. But but the Renaissance legacy appropriates everything basically. So. Um, so that that was one of the things that I disliked, you know, the, the the centrality of the human in this theater, as in a in a photographer's studio, you know, the human being is everything else is a backdrop basically, yeah, uh, and uh, also the 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 aim towards um, completeness as an ag agenda, the aim towards perfectibility and completeness. So uh, the thing must look hyper real. Uh, the the classical sculptures the the pleats on the gown must be uh, beautifully and astonishingly accurately visible and as I say in that essay the pleats would te set my teeth on edge uh -huh. you know uh, 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 and 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 so I was trying to figure out why because we had been told astonishing development you look at the way they've done the pleats you know I said well, I wish they'd never done the pleats in that way <laughs> you know and, and the same thing with perspective you know um, uh, again seen as an astonishing development the idea of development I is also key to this rhetoric that completeness is the end of development that the aim of development is to complete and perfect something uh, which which other cultural movements including cultural movements later on in the West refute mm -hmm. that that completeness might be an agenda might be a might be a valid aim uh, in fact uh, for many people the a valid aim is to disrupt completeness yeah so so just to just to be clear is it the sense that they sort of um, it's not just sort of an, an aesthetic immediate aesthetic rejection it's not just the sort of the the uh, physical representation of the police that set your teeth on edge there's a whole sort of structural sort of almost like a narrative to how the the position that renaissance art occupies right. in the way that we we right. talk about art more there generally. is a there is a narrative uh, uh there's a it has a relation to a narrative that has to do with the kind of writer that i am mm -hmm. and being the kind of writer that i am or doomed to be mm -hmm. makes me have to excavate histories which refute that one mm -hmm. which i'm doomed not to be part of mm -hmm. You know, I wish I wish I could go and admire a Renaissance painting. When this is what I always feel, it would be it would be nice to live in that world where I, you know I I could just go there and and enjoy it. It's not a comfortable place to be in to to kind of dislike things which you're supposed to really admire. Uh, so once that begins to happen, and then you realize that it's it's connected to a whole kind of structuring that has to do with culture and and um, and the way you yourself are putting your kind of investments mm -hmm. out there then then you realize that i mean these are these things have to be addressed then coming out of that moment where you looked at something and said i, I really don't like this you know yeah so it's also just to, sorry. No, sorry. Do, you, do you want me to take that uh, yeah. um, uh, yeah, it's also st strategic in a sense. Uh, you're yeah. also um, to 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 use uh, your your um, the title of your um, other um, uh, collection of essays. It's also clearing a space for your kind of writing, and for the parameters in which you want to be read. Mm. Um, uh, Absolutely, yeah. It's 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 kind of making a case for uh, and trying to understand the predilection towards incompleteness. Yeah. Uh, and it's important to do that because that predilection or that preference seems to get kind of subdued and muffled. Mm. If we if we were having this conversation eighty years ago, 
then we would be talking about the excitement of incompleteness mm. uh, but since we're having this conversation now we've forgotten the excitement of 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 the fragmentary or or the or we see it as a particular kind of nostalgia uh we also see it now as a, as a kind of a modernist inheritance and 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 therefore a western inheritance but it isn't a western mm. inheritance at all uh so um so you know uh it's it's trying to uh Mm. understand again uh in in the face of a particular kind of mm, in a, a way of looking at things that privileges uh narrative and representation mm. as as uh, as over uh disruption uh and and if disruption is talked about it's immediately then misinterpreted to be traumatic a disruption can be liberating mm. you know so we are looking at the joy of the incomplete and w- how it liberates us from the tyranny of representation go then we go back to wolf wolf talking about um the dreadful business of the realist novelist having to describe what happens between breakfast and dinner <laughs> so 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 we we are going uh, then going back to recovering those people who have spoken about this tyranny of of uh, uh, of representation which is still very much with us in in new new kinds of ways yeah this this tyranny i mean it seems to trace an interesting trajectory because it's it, as you you mentioned wolf and like you talked a little bit about the the modernist and there seemed to be this sort of um this coming to the fore of this uh of this disruptive approach this sort of this embrace of the the incomplete mm-hmm. and then but as you say today the 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 realist novelist very much um i don't know if necessarily in the ascendancy but it's it's very much established its place mm-hmm. as um the kind of the the standard for the so-called literary novel and this is something that you deal with um you approach several times in the essays about the the change particularly since um the 80s mm-hmm. and particularly the effect of the, the sort of the um the change to the business of publishing Mm-hmm. has had on the on the kind of novels that get promoted and perhaps the kind of novels that get written. Mm. So, you know, uh, obviously um uh, 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 realism now is a much kind of um much broader thing than 19th century realism. But the 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 kind of agenda of perfectibility and of replicating reality is still very much there but it, it comes in different guises it's it's it most powerfully there in fact in science fiction movies mm-hmm. um uh, and in harry potter you know for instance i mean the uh, fantasy mm-hmm. fantasy is is another vehicle for this kind of um um for special effects mm-hmm. uh, bringing into a wor- uh, into the world uh, what what a kind of fantastic world might look like mm-hmm. that so the the fantastic world is not Let's say the fantastic world is the world of the Ramayan. Mm-hmm. Another one of the epics. The Ramayan being the subject of, of let's say Kathakali dance or or or, or you know I mean a, a classical dance in India would would be sort of represented through gesture. So you don't actually you don't have sets over there replicating a a scene from the Ramayan. If if miraculous or uh, uh, astonishing things have happened in the world of the ramayan they are being represented through mime and gesture and really through synecdoche mm-hmm. you know so so gesture stands for something mm-hmm. like the rain mm-hmm. even uh, uh in 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 the way things work now with say with fantasy and fantasy fantasy cinema it's supposed to be fantasy mm-hmm. but it's ultra realistic you know in the sense that, that nothing is left to gesture mm-hmm. it's all replicated you know so you have to see uh what what's happening exactly and how people are flying or t- t- mutating into this so what mm-hmm. you know um uh, tarkovsky is a filmmaker who completely rejects that so if you look at solaris in in uh, tarkovsky solaris it's just a mass of smoke mm-hmm. you know, he, he looks out at the planet he's just used some smoke mm-hmm. that's it uh, there's nothing else there through that he's expect that is the, that is his synecdoche mm-hmm. that is the planet we are we are now sort of meant to experience it in our imaginations mm-hmm. in the same way that the dancer in kathakali is uh, gesturing and bringing into existence rain mm-hmm. but the, but the aesthetics of um, 
of Harry Potter is is different. I mean, uh, the the planet will be completely properly fleshed out, you know, uh, the, through a variety of technological means. So um, so it. On that in in that le uh, on that level, I mean, so even the ma so magic realist n n n novel mm -hmm. uh, carries with it uh, a, a kind of burden of giving us a particular world and and a kind, a kind of movements of history that has that 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 have created that world. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know when when uh, towards the beginning of Hundred Years of Solitude, ice is seen for the first time. I ice uh, represents. A great deal to do with the movements that have created that particular world, mm. um, and I, I think there is that burden, uh, just as in fantasy, on on in magic realism, on various things, uh, which which is the burden of nothing being superfluous, mm. uh, everything having some kind of place in the grammar of that particular realism, whether that re gra grammar is ni uh, 19th century realism or uh, magic realism. So, um, so, you, you, so if, if you have a lot of flying elephants about, let's say, that is part of, that, of the grammar of that realism. It doesn't really release you into something mm -hmm. where you're no longer shackled by what, what Wolf said was the kind of join between breakfast and dinner. So this kind of join is still being kind of observed in, uh, uh, in, in the case of those novels by, by sort of throwing out a kind of um, uh, flying elephant every uh, five pages. <laughs> you know, but that is part of that a particular grammar again mm -hmm. uh, of what has to be observed. Uh, the grammar of, of the novel, which, which one uh, tries to escape. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Nabokov, who had a different kind of sen sensibility, but yet yet kind of, I think, adhered to this grammar uh, a, a little too much mm -hmm. for his own temperament. Um, called it one of, one of the novel's inner coordinates, that you introduce a, an uncle with a limp mm -hmm. a, a, on page 10. You have to then, if it's a novel, in, introduce him on uh, page uh, 25 or 60. Mm -hmm. You cannot forget this. This is part of the inner coordinates of the novel. And, and so th that could, could change in a magic realist novel, as I said, into the flying elephant or whatever. Uh, one wants to get out of that particular grammar. You know, one wants to explore a novel where one, is, one isn't following uh, that, that, those inner coordinates, that particular grammar. Poetry can make those transitions. I, I believe mm -hmm. the novel can as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, is it is it also why uh, you said that uh, most of your novels are characterized by brevity mm. uh, compared to unlike long novels, which give the illusion um, that you know um, illusion of veracity and illusion of storytelling. Uh, whereas I think in one of your essays you say that you'd like. Um, uh, your novel to be read as an assemblage of paragraphs that you could perhaps start reading in the middle, uh, right. at the end, or at the beginning. So right. with no linearity, um, right. but uh, yes, indeed, a kind of a wonder um, yeah. uh, at form as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, I, I think yeah, that whole paragraph thing is 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 uh, sort of um, is relevant. Uh, here, I mean, in the sense that I have always been drawn. If if there's if I've been drawn to any th any unit in in writing, in in prose writing, in in fiction, it's been the paragraph, and and th because I I kind of encountered. You know, I used to read a lot of poetry, and I wanted to actually become a poet. Uh, I, I I wanted to become a famous poet, uh, <laughs> but but then I didn't I didn't I didn't want to. Uh, uh, ever write novels, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I encountered the nov nov novel in in the in the guise of or in the incarn in its incarnation as quotations mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. critical essays about novels. So the, uh, two come to mind. Uh, one is. I can't remember who wrote the essay, but it was an essay about V.S. Naipaul's A House for Mr. Biswas. The other was Randall Jarrell writing about uh, The Man Who Loved Children by Christina Stead. And uh, I, I, I remember uh, Jarrell's <coughs> quote of, uh, from, from, from Christina Stead's uh, The Man Who Loved Children was completely arresting. I remember the quote from uh, Naipaul's A House for Mr. Biswas was... 
a paragraph about Biswas in, tr in Trinidad when he's just beginning his life as a sign painter. Mm -hmm. So Biswas is a daydreamer. He's, he's married into a family much richer than his own. So he's dominated by his in-laws. He's a, he's a kind of daydreamer and he doesn't do very much. He has a kind of ambition to write. He begins life as a bus conductor where, he, where the main pleasure he seems to have is just uh, uh, um, utter the names of the various stops. Mm -hmm. So Naipaul gives that a bit of space, you know. And then um, this particular paragraph uh, is about him beginning life as a sign painter, his next job. And uh, loving two letters, S and R, and, and being unable to kind of choose between them as to which is the best letter in the English language. <laughs> and, 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 and he, he kind of so the S has such wonderful movement, but R has such nobility, etc. You know, so the, uh, this is one paragraph. I kept re reading that paragraph again and again and again. So th there was no, n no new information in it in terms of what Mr. Biswas's life was. It allowed me to create Biswas in a way that had no kind of uh, verisimilitude or, or, or fleshed out kind of qualities. It create him in another way, mm -hmm. to enter him. Um, and I kept reading that paragraph again and again, and I thought, damn, I have to now read the book. I, d I wish I didn't have to read the book, <laughs> you know? I just want to read this paragraph, you know? Um, when I look back on it, I, it seems to me that each paragraph should be, should have that quality which I ascribe to the opening paragraph. Mm -hmm where uh, the, the narrative has still not experienced um, the, the, um, the compulsions and the grammar of, 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 of storytelling. Mm -hmm. The opening paragraph just, just talks about the room mm -hmm. and where we are. To me, this fact of being here is more important than the story. Um, I want every paragraph, even if it then gets incorporated in the story, to also be about the fact of being here mm -hmm. and being here for the first time, as the first paragraph establishes. So, in a, in a good work, any paragraph should then work on two levels. One is, it, it kind of is part of the unfolding story, if there is any story that's unfolding. And the other level, it stands alone because it, it once again opens out onto the fact of existence, mm -hmm. of our being here. Mm -hmm. So you, you should be able to take it out and be able to transfix, read it. Mm -hmm. And this is true of prose. It's true of, I think, Kalidas's plays as well, that, you know, you should be able to take out any... Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm talking about a Sanskrit play playwright from fourth, the 4th century. You should be able to take any of it out and be able to read it mm -hmm. as, 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 an, as, as the establishment of an, a fresh opening. Mm -hmm. Every moment is a fresh opening in, in, in a narrative work. It might be part of a narrative, of a recounting, of a, st of a story being told, but it also should have this other level on which it mm -hmm. is also alive. And... and why do you think that works for you specifically on the the paragraph level? I mean, there's one of the there's a moment where you write, "I don't subscribe to the idea of the strong opening sentence." Mm. Um, now, putting aside the fact that that's actually quite a strong opening sentence to begin mm. an essay mm. with, mm. Um, why why is why is the paragraph the unit rather than the sentence? Do you, what what is it? Do you think this is how I the encountered uh, 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 this this mm. whole business of lifelikeness? Mm -hmm. In the paragraph. The opening sentence, it just irritates me, the idea of the opening sentence, yeah. because it's, it's fetishized, especially by creative writing uh, kind of um, courses. You have to have an uh, 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 you know, you have to have so, 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 the strong opening sentence. There are a lot of things that, 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 that uh, you know, that's supposed to be kind of uh, surefire ways of d achieving something. So, um, the paragraph, again, whether, whether it's in a... Um, so the paragraph is a quote. So the way I discovered it was as a quote. Mm -hmm. so, so, so when I'm talking about that paragraph from Naipaul, it was a quote. I love, I love quotations. I feel the same way about the way the, the, the wasteland has been composed as a kind of montage. You know, I, 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 I feel the same way about um, um, 
what Benjamin said about about wanting to write a book entirely composed of quotations. I, f- I felt the same way about my my anthology, the Picador Book of Modern Indian Writing or Literature, whatever it was called, uh, which I kind of assembled. Mm-hmm. I kind of it, it was an assemblage of 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 works, um, and 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 that's that's something I like. I don't want it to get kind of homogenized into either an idea of a story. Or the idea of this is an anthology about Indian writing. You're going to surely you're going to find mm-hmm. Indian writing represented here. I want it to be an assemblage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was a moment where you're talking about the um, the writers you included in that anthology, and you say that they had survived the alarming burgeoning of the Indian novel in English. Right. Um, and I was just I, I found that a really fascinating um, turn of phrase. But I must confess to not being entirely sure quite what you were referring to perhaps due to my own ignorance of the the sort of the indian novel in english generally so i was wondering if you might so this no, uh, this anthology was i mean i was working on it from the kind of mid 90s onwards i think it came out in 2002 or something so i was still dealing with the fact that the indian novel in english had sudden suddenly become uh, synonymous with indian writing not just the indian novel but with indian writing um and I use the word burgeoning, uh, I think, because um, b- b- to I must have been subconsciously kind of connecting it with the word boom, mm-hmm. and and the, the, the economic boom. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about a time after economic deregulation mm-hmm. in India from 1991 onwards, where initially for the last, for, sorry, for the first 15, 20 years, I mean, uh, there was great um, uh, sort of um, excitement and even arrogance. Mm-hmm about about uh, what was happening in terms of the economy and uh, um and it seemed that uh, yeah so so the, that 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 the future of of these countries uh, uh, lay in in the fact that they had these vast markets mm-hmm. um and and uh and a lot of the rhetoric then began to get transposed into other arenas <laughs> and other arenas which should have been dealing with a language uh, of of inquiry uh, and 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 what it means also to to discover a pleasure in a work mm-hmm. from sentence to sentence, but also what it means to then, if the work is new, what it means to find a new language with which to understand what is going on and how that ple- pleasure is achieved. Mm-hmm. Leaving all those kind of things to one side, uh, the language of the boom uh, had had begun to shape other kinds of languages, uh, and and this was happening with literature as well. There is enough to say that in, you know that the, that the literature, like the country, was booming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. On this question of of um, um, Indian literature, which is thank you. <coughs> um, um, a contested ca- category, and and uh, you've in, in many of your essays you you um, uh, take issue with the category of Indian literature. Um, but I wanted to go back to um, that question, that issue of criticism as the invention of a lineage, and. Um, uh, you've said in earlier interviews that you had to construct lineages for yourself. Um, and that's why speaking up for certain writers or speaking up for certain uh, practices um, was important. And in the eponymous essay, The Origins of Dislike, you say the artist argues for the survival not of a species, a race, a class, but of a particular practice or lineage. Uh-huh. Um and so you, you summon, in in these essays, you summon or talk, um, you summon a lot of non-Indian uh, writers or figures, Benjamin, Bart, Borges, and many others, but you also summon a lot of Indian writers. Mm. Uh, and many of these writers are poets. Mm. Um, so, Arvind Krishna Merotra, Arun Kolatkar, um, Tagore, Tagore Nesim mm. yeah. Um uh, Why is that? Uh, could you perhaps... Uh, Tell us uh, why these particular poets um, uh, um, are so important for you, or what do you identify in them? Um, what what is it that you recognize of your own practice as a writer in these uh, poets? Okay. Um, 
Sure, I'll, I'll try and answer that. Uh, um, <coughs> there's something you said as you were leading up to the final kind of thing that I wanted to respond to as well, uh, or the lineages and, and, yeah. and all of that. Um, yeah, I guess what I wanted to say about lineages was um you know yeah finding myself uh, uh writing in a particular way and and um you know um finding myself unconnected to um ways of writing that had been kind of determined to be the, 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 the sort of way one wrote if one was an Indian or um, not even being particularly interested in India as a subject, you know, and trying to understand where that was coming from, finding it then among uh, the majority of Indian writers who wrote in various languages that they were not interested in Indian, India as a subject, and finding it odd that uh, this whole idea then became, uh, that uh, dominated other ways of talking about writing in India. Um, so so try, trying to work around that. Uh, and and, and w when I was doing that uh, to, to sort of then having to rewrite uh, this idea of one's, of what one's lineage is, um, having no sense of, increasingly feeling one had no sense of uh, ownership. Um, so the, 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 the affinities were not coming from a sense of ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, the affinities were coming from a sense of a particular kind of thing being valued in practice. And, and then trying to uncov uncover what, what those things were. Um, as far as you, meant, you, you asked me to, to kind of speak about the Indian poets that you mentioned and what my mm -hmm. affinities with them might be. And this might also eventually lead to the idea to uh, to talk about a little bit about ownership as well. Mm -hmm. For firstly, I mean, uh, people like Arvind Krishna Mehrotra and um, Arun Kolatkar. I, I, I mean, these are uh, poets who wrote in the 60s and 70s and wrote in English. <coughs> uh, but they wrote at a time when uh, uh, when I I I English was uh, kind of looked down upon. Uh, by Indians as being a, a kind of colonizer's tongue, inauthentic kind of vehicle for uh, f for expressing oneself as an Indian. Mm. And it was also looked down upon by uh, um, Europeans and, 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 and uh, English and American writers as, uh, for, the, for the, basically the same reasons. And, uh, you know, the, the whole business of inauthenticity had still not become sexy. You know, uh, that that turn was going to happen in the 80s when, you know, not to be authentic would suddenly legitimize kind of certain kinds of cultural experiments in other cultures. But at that time, it was still important to be authentic. So how could it be authentic in this language? They went ab about their business in this kind of uh, extremely intelligent, uh, absorbed and blithe manner in that they put the question to one side. They, they saw it, as Buddha said, about various questions as an irrelevant question. Mm -hmm. Buddha said, you know, don't do this, don't do that. These, these, these are, don't, don't attend to this. These are completely irrelevant stuff. Don't go under a tree, tree, tree and starve yourself to find enlightenment. It won't happen that way. But he tried it out and he saw, he saw that nothing was happening. So similarly, um, I mean, these, these, these poets decided certain questions are, I mean, even if they didn't say as much, by, by their practice, they, they stated certain questions are of no interest to us and are completely irrelevant. And this uh, whole question of what it is that constitutes experience and what it is that constitutes an Indian poet's experience at a, a certain point of time was left open-ended. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, uh, Mehrotra openly took from Borges uh, the idea that, you know, I, I, there, is no, there are no reliable kind of markers of identity. So Borges says, uh, uh, if, 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 and he says wrongly, but anyway, it's, it's fine that he said it. I've been told that this is wrong. He says, the Quran has no, uh, has no camels in it. Uh, and this is a sure sign that it's an Arabic text. If, if it w uh, were not an Arabic text, or if it were not a real Arabic text, it would, they would be full of uh, camels. Uh -huh. 
you know so so they, this the, the indian poets of that time went about it in the same manner that you know we don't have to put in the equivalent of camels this is not our main preoccupation as writers um this this i liked about the way they were kind of reformulating how one might act and write and think about writing in english uh, it's a legacy that was forgotten i think uh, and and had to be brought back um with tagore there are many things to 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 kind of uh, really kind of admire about tagore but i'll just i'll just speak about one thing which which uh, which is of great interest to me tagore was very very uh felt very beholden to this 4th century sanskrit poet whom i mentioned earlier called kalidas mm-hmm. um and at, at the same time said we cannot go back to that world of kalidas so he he was kind of transfixed by kalidas's world that came back to him through kalidas's poetry as in the same way that i was transfixed by let's say the the the, the paragraph from naipaul he would he would just keep studying it again and again while at the same time realizing that it's not going to be available to me in completeness you know it i i cannot go back to it i cannot capture it the the great testament of this kind of belief and this experience is his poem megdut megdut is a a, a poem written by tagore about reading a poem by kalidas a great canonical long poem by Ka- kalidas called megdut megdut means cloud messenger kalidas writes a great poem about a man telling a cloud to ca- carry his message to his beloved who lives in another place so then the the cloud journeys across various kinds of geographies and climates as it goes on its way it's it's full of long full of longing but also full of the sensuousness of that world and that journey um tagore's Meg- megdut is an account of reading megdut on a rainy day and he, and he talks about entering that world that that kalidas is describing so he's there with kalidas in that world from the 4th century or whenever it was at the end of tagore's poem he kind of wakes up and he realizes the world has gone he can only hear the rain it's similar to say let's say reading any poem including say the gita that the thing has ended something has happened uh which was not dependent on you having got something and possess something this is uh, uh uh in 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 a complete sort of contrast to say the 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 ambitions of a historian who wants to capture the age or a historical novelist who wants to capture it who wants to give you again as wolf said about the realist giving you everything that happened between breakfast and dinner wants to give you every detail uh, and and no detail is unconscious of the fact that it is playing a part in that period in history while we actually know that none of us know we are living in history all of us are are, are unknowing about this fact um tagore Tego- desires to inhabit that world for as long as he can inhabit it and then let it go this i think is 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 wonderful and also a wonderful acknowledgement that you cannot you have no ownership of your past you, you do not own it it is not yours as an indian or as 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 european it it's not yours um i think that that's that's a great kind of lesson <coughs> Um I'm very conscious that we're getting quite close to the end of time and I would like to um uh, have a have a short reading before before we wrap up and before we um squeeze in a few uh, audience questions. Yeah. Um we talked about readings both from the origins of this like and friend of my youth. Do you have a a preference, preference for yeah. which one you would like to? Uh, um Since I've been talking endlessly about the uh, origins of dislike, I will uh, I will read from a friend of my youth. Um <laughs> um Just give me a second as I find the page. Yeah. Um so um 
I'm 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 reading a bit uh, from a from friend of my youth, my my novel, uh, my last novel, and um, I have actually uh, two essays here about about kind of questions that arise from mm, <laughs> from from this novel for me, uh, and questions that I was kind of trying to grapple with. Um, but also because I, as a as a writer, I am uh, I, I have always been sort of uh, um, sort of interested in the form of the essay uh, uh, as a novelist as well, it, it, as something that uh, uh, kind of permits a sort of journey and also blurs the distinction of of the person who's ex experiencing being a part of the text and being outside of it. Uh, that there is no kind of illusory control as there is with an academic text or with a pure novel. That I'm the writer and this is the this is the subject. That, that there is some blurring going on in terms of the person who's in the text and out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and this is something I explore in this novel, which is about which is in three parts. The first part is the longest and. It's a very short novel. Uh, uh, the, the the first part, which is the longest, is about uh, a, a writer uh, <laughs> s s by some strange coincidence called Amit Chaudhary, like myself, uh, arrives in Bombay to read from a novel called The Immortals, which also happens to be a novel that I've written. Um, so uh, and 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 and. Ich, Bombay is the city he grew up in. Again, oddly, I, I grew up there, but whatever. I mean, he, he, he's back there, and, and there are three sources of unsettlement as far as he's concerned, in, 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 in Amit Chaudhary is concerned. The first is, he grew up in Bombay, but he, he doesn't have property there anymore. He doesn't have a home there anymore, so every time he visits Bombay, he must stay in a hotel, or as this time he staying in a club, which in fact overlooks the house in which he grew up. That's the first kind of s sense of strangeness, of being in a hotel room in the city in which you grew up. Uh, the second has to do with the fact that Ramu, his childhood friend, who became a drug addict and is the only person who he kept in touch with from his school, um, has, has, has um, gone into rehab because he, he almost died from his drug addiction. He's gone into rehab and is inaccessible. This kind of inaccessibility has its impact on uh, Amit Chaudhary, which he hadn't foreseen. He, he would never have expected this absence to have that particular kind of impact. And, and, and the third is, has to do with the Taj, uh, the, this hotel, where he goes to do an errand, uh, exchange some shoes for his mother. Uh, and the Taj has recently, like, one and a half years before the book begins, been attacked by terrorists. And, and, and so when he goes to the Taj, it's been more or less restored. But he knows that this Taj which he's seeing now is not the same Taj as it was before the terrorist attacks when it was completely, parts of it completely burnt and gutted. So he's seeing something like Bombay which has continuity, but it actually has no continuity. It is not the past. So, um, I'm reading from the third and the final section when uh, Amit goes back to Bombay a second time after that first reading uh, with his wife and his daughter to actually uh, sp spend a few days in the Taj. <coughs> I see Bombay sooner than I'd expected and Ramu. The reason is banal. Barely a month's passed. My daughter's annual exams are done. My wife has one of her bouts of intense longing. She's keen to leave everything, everything being Calcutta. Jais Jaisalmer, she says. For two decades, she's wanted to introduce me to Rajasthan, the forts, palaces, shrines, the brown horizons. But I'm resistant to history. I suppose I become uncooperative. Mm. Are you mad? Do you know how hot it will be? I have no interest in the peacocks. It turns out our daughter would tolerate going to Bombay. With its shops, cinemas and cafes, Bombay history's very antithesis. And clearly you don't need an excuse, says my wife. She's at once resigned and invigorated. There's the prospect of much window shopping. Tell you what, I reply, let's stay at the Taj. The old wing. I'll grovel and wheedle a special rate. She stares at me. 
I don't splurge on hotels. They're taken care of by publishers and festivals. Holidays are combined with readings, a discounted package. And I've never stayed in the old wing. There was never a reason or opportunity. I plead for a reduction. I do my best to impress the manager. You know, I wrote about the Taj for the Guardian the day after 26 November. I see, sir, he says with the requisite gravity. I go on, now shameless. Actually, a bit of my fifth novel describes the Taj. <laughs> Out of a sense of decency, he gives me a near affordable rate for a sea-facing room. The outing remains a secret. I don't tell my daughter. I want to surprise her. My mother-in-law breaks it to her when they are together. I hear you'll be at the Taj. My daughter forgets to mention this, so we don't know that she knows till I tell her later. I hardly tell anyone in Bombay except Ramu. I don't want Janardhan to take over the visit. Janardhan is the publishing rep. This is pure holiday. My wife and I resolve not to tell the wider world, because it might be best that people don't know we are staying in a fancy place. It's sure to be held against us. By now, I'm well into a book. It's about Bombay. I've been writing it for a year. I tell my wife, it isn't a holiday for me. It's a research trip. It's a well-known fact that no novel is taken seriously in India until a good deal of research has gone into it. This stay in the Taj will be my research. <clears throat> Going down the stairs will be my research. So will looking out at the sea. In the meantime, because I'm writing, I'm thinking of Bombay. I think of Ramu. The Ramu I know and the Ramu I'm writing about have become indistinguishable. The same is true of the Bombay I'm recounting from experience and the Bombay I'm assembling through words. This is often how novels begin for me. There's a convergence. I live. Then something prompts me to write. The writing is not about life. It is a form of living. The two happen simultaneously. I love the title Friend of My Youth from an Alice Munro story. I haven't read the story. That's because the title must have implied a possibility. When that happens, when the title or first paragraph contains a promise, I become spellbound and keep returning to it. The work becomes irrelevant. The writer in me takes over from the reader, and my inquiet premonition of what the story will be dominates the story itself. I've hoarded titles and paragraphs for this reason, but never followed through. Naturally, when I first fell in love with Alice Munro's title, I had no idea that I'd one day want to write about Ramu and Bombay. Ramu was still to vanish. The experience of feeling unexpectedly bereft was to come. So, was, so were the attacks of 26 November. As these and other events happened, it's as if the title knew it had to meet them halfway, sensed it and they had been travelling towards each other. The book is a novel. I'm pretty sure of that. What marks out a novel is this. The author and the narrator are not one, even if by coincidence they share the same name. The narrator's views, thoughts, observations, essentially the narrator's life, are his or her own. The narrator might be created by the author but is a mystery to him. The provenance of his or her remarks and actions is never plain. Okay. Thank you so much. I fear with time getting on, we probably don't have time for audience questions, but um, the conversation is not over, but as always here, we're going to be serving wine. Uh, Amit's going to be here signing books. Uh, we have plenty of copies of The Origins of Dislike available at the, the front, as well as Friend of My Youth and plenty of uh, Amit's backlist as well. So please go and have a look at it up there and then come up here and, uh, and get your book signed. Continue the conversation. Ask If you did have questions you wanted to ask, please don't hesitate to come and ask them up here. Continue the conversation with us, continue the conversation with each other, and please join me one more time in thanking Letitia Sakini and Amit Chatter. Thank you, Brooke.